This morning comes from Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. Hear now the reading of God's holy word. For by the grace given to me, I bid everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned him. For as in one body we have many members, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who contributes in liberality." He who gives aid with zeal, he who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May God's blessing be upon us. And may God protect us from the enemy that is constantly at work trying to steal God's word from us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So a consistent theme in Paul's letters, and so I mean, it's, in, it's kind of worked into all of them, is the recognition and, and the exhortation or the call to remind the, the newly formed Christian communities um, that... Um, that they are citizens of something new. Um, some of them are, some of these communities are, are actually what we would call like foreigners in a foreign land. And some of them, because they're of their decision to become followers of Jesus and to be a part of this community, are kind of outcast in their own land. Um, but, 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 but in their own way, they, he's reminding the, the, the church that they are becoming something new. And he has to do that because we all understand um, what happens when, when, when people move into a new place, even if it's emotionally, spiritually, or if it's actually, like many of you, you move into a new place. One of the things we do is we talk about how much better it was back where we came from. It's okay. I mean, it's, we, we, we just can't, we can't help it. Because we, we like what we came from and we want to, and, and the truth is we left for some reasons the things that weren't good, but we want to keep that which is good and bring it with us. And so it's not just, a, it's not just everything's bad here and we like it better back then. It's, we, we want to bring it with us um, and we want to celebrate some of that. Um, and, and, and that's okay. When we, do, we do that in many different ways. When, again, I was I'm serving in North Myrtle Beach and every year um, they, had the, they had the greatest celebration of cultures that you could ever put together. I don't know if that's true or not. It just sounds better to say it that way. It was the Irish Italian Festival. I mean, they do it as huge. Everybody, Irish, I don't know why they decided to put the Irish and Italians together or who came up with that. But what a, we'll celebrate these cultures. And, um, and again, but I guess that means there's going to be a lot of things going on that are Irish and Italian. I'm, you can decide what that is. Um, but, but, but we, we, we like to, to remember where we came from and, and we hold on to it. And, and again, those who have come to this country from other places and have immigrated here um, know that all too well. You know, my, my, my children's mom um, was Greek and, or is Greek. Um, and so my children are half Greek. Um, by, by birth. And so they like to, when they're around like the Greek festival or they go to a Greek restaurant, they like to say, well, you know, I'm half Greek. And, and, they, and there's usually a couple questions that they're asked after that. They, well, where are you from? Is the, the first question when you say, well, I'm half Greek. Well, where are you from? And you're like, well, I grew up in Myrtle Beach and we lived in Columbia. My dad lives in Simpsonville now. And they're like, no, 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 no. Where are you from? Not where you live, not where you're at. Where are you from? Oh, we're from, or my people are from the island of Hios, they'll say. That's, they trace it back to a little island off of Turkey. Um, where are you from? And then they asked another question, do you speak Greek? Well, a little bit, um, but 
They want to know what you brought with you, how connected you are as you come in. And that's, that's true in all cultures. Where, who are you? Where are you from? What are you, what are you doing? And Paul's reminder to the church, the ancient church 2,000 years ago, Rome, Ephesus, Corinth, Galatia, name it, is a reminder that it's not where you're from, but where you're going. Who are you becoming? What are you going to look like as we grow into who we are supposed to be? And he's really clear about that throughout all of them. Who are we going to become? And you have a new identity. You are immigrants. As much as you'll try to hang on to your identity and celebrate it, Christians must recognize in each and every age, from the beginning to right now, Christians must recognize that our true home, that which we need to celebrate is not that which is behind us, but that which is right now with us and before us. Our true home is in heaven. Our true home is eternity. And we're growing into that. That's, a, that's an important thing to remember. What are we going to become? Not where do we come from, where are we going to become? And that's true, again, for every church in every age, it's true for Advent and United Methodist Church. What are we going to become? And Paul doesn't just leave it there. Um, in today's part of today's scripture lesson, he gets right to the heart of what it means to be a part of the Christian life, to the most intimate expression of what it means to be Christian. And that means to live together in community, to do this, to gather, to live together in community. And that's an important thing. And community is, is, is he uses the, um, the, the body, the body, like the body, we live together and we all have a particular and specific and necessary purpose that we need to recognize how important that is. Community, it's simple, it's with unity. It's one of the easiest words to figure out what it really means. To live together, to commune together, to live together in unity. Not uniformity. Sometimes we get confused that everybody has to be the same way and get the same thing. And no, it's not uniformity. We are necessarily diverse in our, in, in, in our unity because everybody has a different gift. Everybody has a special gift. Everybody has a, something that they were gifted by God to do and to become. That's, that's just a fact. We're created in God's image and God gifts all of us. And that's an important, a very important thing to remember. And the recognition, and he says early on in this, because he wants to make sure we know, for by the grace given to me, I bid everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That's where that starts. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. And he's talking specifically about gifts because so often in church life, in the, in the life of the community, we think that gift's much more important. Without that gift, we can't do what we're doing. And so that gift has to be set higher. I mean, every time I stand up in church and, and, and hear music being played at, 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 the, um, at the nine o'clock service um, with the, um, the orchestral pieces and the, the the, the, the instruments, um, I'm always amazed. And when I see the band playing together, I'm always amazed because I've always wanted to be able to play an instrument. And I've tried to play an instrument. I was in um, elementary school band. I played the trumpet. And I say that lightly, saying I played the trumpet. That means I played with a trumpet generally. And I could blow into it and I could probably figure out where the notes were on it, but I was horrible. I, I mean, I was not good. And, and that's not because I didn't try hard or because the, the, the band leader wasn't any good. Um, um, he, he's, a, he's still a good friend of mine um, um, and I um, love Larry, he did his best. But on those days when I was there, maybe somebody else didn't show up and it was just two or three of us and, the other person there was kind of like me, didn't really belong in band. We sat around and talked about ACC basketball more than we played the trumpet. I didn't have that gift. And now, now it would be easy for me to say, well, if you have that gift, you're more important because I can't do it. And I think of myself as being pretty important. That must be, 
That's not how it goes. It's a gift that's be, to be shared and to recognize that. Paul wants us to recognize, he says, don't think of yourself more highly than others because God has given each and every one of us a gift and God wants us to share those gifts. All are gifted. And it's the, it's the duty of the community of faith to recognize that this is a place full of gifted people. Some can preach, some can pray, some can play, some can lead, some like working with little children and medium-sized children and big children, some like working with adults, some like doing mission work, some are gifted in the ability to just be present. You already heard about, uh, there's somebody in this room right now that's gifted and you don't even know how gifted you are because every time you walk by the box back there, you see all the lights and stuff going on, it's kind of intimidating. But, but you're being called to help out. You're gifted and don't even know it because sometimes we recognize our gifts immediately. And sometimes we think we want to have a gift and we don't have it. But the community's job is to help us point out that you're gifted in this. Most of the things that I'm gifted at, somebody had to tell me I was gifted at. Russell, you do such a good job with and they fill in something, I'm like, no, I didn't ever thought about that. I'm not that good at that. No, no, you're great at that. Really? Yes. And that, then I grow into it. Is there somebody out there? But maybe you're not. Maybe that's not your calling. Maybe you want to. Maybe maybe you feel like you're being called to help, and you have the gift to help or to organize. You know, Backpack Blessings is always looking for somebody to help out. It's an amazing, immense project that goes on. I haven't seen it yet. I just have heard this over and over again, how amazing and immense and beautiful a project it is. And they always need people to help. And anybody can come and help and show up to help. It's in the bulletin. Look on the back of it. There's a time there. If you can't find it, call the office. Somebody will tell you when to show up. But the gift, the gift of being able to help and to organize and be patient while things are being put together, that's an important thing. So we're all gifted. If you, if you expect a gift sermon to be telling you what your gifts are, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to tell you that it's our job to recognize the giftedness of each and every one here, to uphold those gifts and, and to recognize that those gifts are what make us who we are, to help us discover our gifts. And so again, some of them just may appear to you, oh, I'm gifted, wow. And, but more often than not, we need somebody to encourage us to see the gifts in us that we don't see in ourselves to see that happen. And Paul gives a list of gifts in here. Um, I'm not gonna read it again. It's not an exhaustive list. It may be a categorical list, but there's so many more gifts. And that's important for us to recognize all the gifts that are in there and to recognize how gifted you are and recognize there's a place to use those gifts right now in the church, right now. I mean, Alex went through a whole list of things we need to, to be a part of. To, to serve and to be in ministry is what we're called to do. And again, the, the interesting thing that Paul does, and even in this particular part of the letter, is that he recognizes that so often we come with our gifts, but with our gifts, we find out that sometimes our ego gets a little puffed up. And when ego gets mixed with grace, we sometimes have problems. Paul is recognizing those problems. He recognizes problems throughout the early church as part of those letters are dealing with some specific problems. But I think we can all recognize that when, when the, my, my importance or your importance becomes more important than the work of the community, that there's a problem. There, there's that wonderful acronym that you use with ego, edging God out. That fits really well here because you're edging God out and grace is God's unmerited gift of love. Your gifts are not something you earned. It's not something you worked hard for. It's not something you, you spent so much time and you finally got to it. It's something that's God-given and given to you. And it's hard for us sometimes to recognize that. But when we mix that ego with grace, we have problems because we forget that God has gifted us to use that gift. That God has helped us with that. And, and it helped us to see it. And that's good for us to recognize that because once we realize that sometimes we think that our giftedness is better than somebody else's, we get in the way of God's work. So I'm not here 
to tell you what your gifts are. I'm here to say you're gifted and we need to work together to figure out what that is, to, to figure out how we're going to organize and plan and move forward as a church. One of the things people keep asking, well, what are we gonna do now, Russell? What's next? We got through all this stuff, you're new. What's the plan? What's the plan? What's the plan? What's the plan? I like that. I'm glad you're excited about the plan. And we're gonna get to the plan. But before we get to the plan, we're, we're, we're taking some time to, to be in each other's presence, to, to be together, to celebrate who we are and who God is calling us to become. And Paul does a great thing for us in, these let, in the letter today because he kind of tells us what we're supposed to do while we're waiting for that plan to come, if we don't know what we're supposed to do. I read three through eight, I'm gonna read nine through 12, nine through 13. Because nine through 13 is a response, well, what am I supposed to do if I don't know what to do. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go through it. Let love be genuine. You can do that. You can let love be genuine. Um, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. That's a little bit harder to do sometimes because we like some of that, but you can try it. Here's one I like. Love one another with brotherly affection. And it goes on, outdo one another in showing honor. Now, maybe you don't want to do all of these. Maybe, maybe like, oh, that's too much. That's too much on my plate. I'll have to be like, love, be genuine, hate what is evil, love one another with brotherly affection, and outdo one another in showing honor. If that's too much, here's, my, here's, here's a suggestion. Pick one and do it over and over again. Just pick one and do it over and over again. You'll be all right. But I, I love this. Is outdo one another in showing honor. It makes it competitive. And I know all you are, you are competitive, see? And when I see the Clemson shirt there and I see the Carolina shirt, I saw a waffle. We're, we want to, this is my team. On, his, on this team, the Christian team, outdo one another in showing honor. See who can do it best. But it doesn't even stop there. Never flag in zeal, be aglow with the Spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in your hope, be patient in tribulation. Oh, there's so much. Again, pick one. And here's one that I know we all can do. It's um, uh, be constant in prayer. I don't know what to do. Be constant. Just do it over and over again. It doesn't stop there. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Practice hospitality. What are we supposed to do? What's next? What's coming up? What, where, are we, where are we going? Well, it says right here, here's what's next. Let's do these things. And I, I'm sure that God will open up a path and show us where we're supposed to go. If we let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another in brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, never flag in zeal, be aglow with the Spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in your hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, practice hospitality. Print it out, stick it on your refrigerator. Print it out, put it on your... On your um, your mirror in your bathroom. Let it pop up on your phone once a day and be reminded, this is what God is calling us to do. We are a gifted people. We have a future where God is calling us to be. And that's who we will become. It's not about looking past and looking in the, in the rear view mirror. When I, when I was starting this sermon, when I, when I mapped out my sermons, this is about a month ago that I was going to preach on gifts, and I picked a cute sermon title, right? No return policy. Because, you know, when you go buy something, somebody says, you cannot, can't return, there's no return policy. And in my mind, I was going in a completely different direction, but, but it, it kept kind of sticking with me that God has gifted us, and we don't get to say, well, God, I don't like this gift. Give me a better gift. Give me a different gift. This is the gift you've been given. There's a no return policy. It's the gift you've been given and go and use it for those things I've read in verses 9 through 13. They are yours. But we as a community are a collection of gifted people and a collection of gifts. And so if that's true, there's also a no return policy for the community, which means we can't go back. We can't go back to who we once were. Now we can hold on to some of those things that we liked about it and bring them forward. But we can't go back. We can't go back to 20 years ago. We can't go back to 12 years ago or six years ago or 12 months ago, nor should we want to because what God is calling us to do as a community of believers is to move forward, 
to go forward, to go out and to become the church that God is calling us to be. That was true for the church at Rome. It's true for the church called Advent United Methodist Church. No return. It's moving forward and becoming what God has called us to be, recognizing and seeking out the gifts in one another, outdoing one another in honor so that we can find who we are and who God is calling us to be and to become. There's no return. Because what defines us is where we're going, not where we've come from. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, We thank you for every opportunity that we have to be in your presence, to share our gifts, to recognize how good you have been to us even when we weren't good to you or each other. And we pray, Lord, that we look for ways to share the gifts that you have given us with each other and with the world. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hello. I'm Russell Freeman. I'm the senior pastor here at Advent United Methodist Church, and we are so happy you chose to join us for online worship today. And we hope you had a wonderful experience in doing so. We would love for you to come down and join us on a Sunday morning at the Five Forks campus here in Simpsonville on Woodruff Road. We have worship services at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. We have offerings for children, for youth, and for adults. Also love for you to join us at our 12 noon service for the Scuffletown campus, currently meeting at our Five Forks campus in the zone. Also, you can learn so much more about us at our webpage at advent-umc.org. Can't wait to see you and get to know you better here at Advent United Methodist Church as we work to make disciples and grow God's kingdom.